Hello, my excellent biologists. Today, it's all about behavior. For Honors Bio, this is chapter 32. All right, so I'm going to make myself a little smaller and start presenting. Hopefully, you're looking down in the de video description and you will see a copy of the notes that my students are using. And those notes will have this entire um, Google slide presentation embedded in them. All right, so here we go. You've got your notes out, you're good to go. So we're gonna start with um, discussing behavior and whether the behavior that is shown, sorry, the behavior that is shown is due to nature or it's due to nurture. So nature would mean it's in your DNA, you're born with it. Or nurture means you're learning it through your environment. So let's start off here. So I gotta make myself smaller. All right, so is there a genetic basis of inheritance? So we're gonna look at several different experiments and observations and see what we can come up with. And I'm gonna tell you right now, the answer looks like it's in the genes, literally. I know, bad joke. So let's start with a lovebird. So there's two species, very similar, a fisher lovebird. So one of the lovebirds takes nesting material and cuts these really long strips of nesting material and flies back with the nesting material in its beak. Then, here we go, we've got another lovebird and it carries smaller pieces of nesting material that it tucks in its rump feathers and then flies back to to build its nest, okay? So we've got this peach-faced lovebird, right? And then the fisher lovebird in the mouth. So what if we mated them? How would they acquire their nesting material? Well, the hybrids cut intermediate length nesting material. It wasn't really long, but it wasn't really short. And they would want to put it into their rump, but because it was intermediate length and wasn't short, it would fall out all the time. So eventually they learned to carry the nesting material in their beak, but every single time before they would take off, they'd have a quick look at their rump for some reason. So this looks like you have some sort of blending. Now we're gonna learn in traits that you have combinations of alleles that come together and they get expressed, but the way this was expressed was that they cut an intermediate length. So if you look at your first set of notes, okay, experiments that suggest that behavior is a genetic, base, genetic basis, if you look at nest building and lovebirds, the part that you need to fill in is towards the end. If behavior is genetic, then breeding birds that carried nesting material differently, long strips in beak versus short strips in their rear feathers, should produce a hybrid, and it did. Should produce a hybrid, and it did. All right, let's look at something else. Now let's look at some snakes. All right, so inland garter snakes, um, they did not, they don't eat slugs, okay? And coastal gardener snakes, those on the coast, do eat slugs. Now you could say, well, maybe because there's more slugs on the coast. And they bred an inland garter snake with a coastal garter snake, and the hybrid kind of like slugs, kind of intermediate, just like we were talking about with the birds. What they came to find out is that it is genetic because it is physiology. The inland garter snakes didn't eat slugs because they had fewer tongue flicks. And as a result, because their tongue is what's doing the tasting in the environment to even know that there are slugs, because they had fewer tongue flicks, they didn't even know slugs were there. The coastal garter snakes in blue here in our diagram had more tongue flicks, so they knew the slugs were there and they would eat them. So the hybrid didn't go slow on the tongue flicks, didn't go fast, it was intermediate, so they had an intermediate affinity for slugs. So on number two, food choice and garter snakes, same idea with food choice with the same idea um, with food choice, coastal snakes eat slugs. Inland snakes, in, darn it, inland snakes do not. Intermediates responded as such. It turns out to be the number of tongue flicks and the ability to taste the slugs. The number of tongue flicks and the ability to taste the slugs. Again, genetic. Okay, and here's another one. This is an observational one. These are twins, okay? These twins were separated at birth for whatever reason, okay? 
They were placed into foster homes by a social worker. Unbeknownst to these twins, the social worker checked on them their whole time growing up. And as what is not, unco it's not uncommon when you're adopted to want to know where you came from. And those girls expressed those feelings. They felt like there was somebody else. They wanted to know their family. The social worker didn't say a thing, right? As it turns out, they found out about this when they were older. They were angry, kind of went after the social work worker, rightfully so, because they found out that they had family and they weren't even far apart. And he was just studying them. And that's kind of pathetic, right? He was lying to them and he was studying them and trying to find out what they liked and what they didn't like. And you know what? What his research showed is they were very, very similar. They had similar mannerisms, similar career choices, similar interests. They had the same favorite movie. And so what that showed is maybe a lot of their preferences they had was all genetic. So on twin studies, Twins that were separated at birth show that they have similar food preferences, activity patterns, and even select mates with similar characteristics. And I'll tell you more about that when we debrief this. All right, aplysia. Okay, aplysia, if you look underneath animal studies, this is an egg laying um, marine snail. And this snail, when it lays its eggs, it's like a big deal. Okay, first it mates and then it will lay its eggs, but it lays literally thousands of eggs in this long goopy string. But in order to kind of protect them, it uses its mouth to grab it and like whip it around all of its egg string into a ball so it can kind of protect all of those eggs. And so it's, it, it expends a lot of energy in order to do that. And it takes a lot of energy and resources even to make those eggs. So what they found out is if they just used a needle and shot the slug with some egg laying hormone, it would start that whole process even if it hadn't made it. And that's the end of your notes where you need to kind of plug that in, even if it has not made it. All right. And another one, we'll watch um, a video about this in class um, when we debrief, but mice they exhibit a mothering, which if like when the baby mice are born and they're blind, if they somehow wander off, the mother will go and get them. Um, the mother will keep them warm by kind of going, being on top like this mouse is and kind of hovering over our babies and make sure that they're okay. But there's a gene and, it, and it, it's the FOSB alleles. They have to be present and activated for her to do that. When they were inactive or absent, the mom mouse, like the babies would wander off and she's like, whatever. She wouldn't go after them or anything. When they were cold and shivering, she wouldn't hover over them. So the question is, is mothering a factor of what genes you get? So that part on your notes on nurturing behavior in mice, you want to finish off the end where the FOSB alleles being present and activated, all right? So now let's look at something else here, all right? In class, I'm gonna show you a video about being stressed out and how if we're stressed, when you become a mother, you actually can pass that on to your children. So we'll save that for our debrief. All right, environmental, oh, sorry, the AL went down. Sorry about that. It's environmental influences on behavior. And I would ask you right now, what looks like what's going on with this girl? She looks angry and she's in a corner. I'm betting she's in timeout. Now, why would the parents put her in timeout? Probably because she was doing something she wasn't supposed to. And they're hoping they teach her a lesson. Like if you behave this way, you're gonna be separated over in the corner and you have timeout. That's when the environment is influencing your behavior. And that has to do with learning, right? So when you study behaviors, some behaviors are really complex and you would think, boy, I bet you had to learn that behavior. But it turns out many of them are triggered by things in the environment, but they're triggering something that's innate and that is a fixed action pattern. So some stimulus triggers that behavior. Um, an example of this is like they have fish that have these these red underbellies and when they're mating, they attack other males with the red underbellies. And when they had these fish in the lab 
and and just a red truck would go by, all the fish would start attacking the red, you know, like at the glass, trying to get out that red truck because that was a releaser for them to to have that attack behavior. So that attack behavior is a fixed action pattern. So for instance, this black widow, if it is a black widow, I'm not 100% sure, this black widow, her mother did not tell her how to spin a web, right? But she could have a stimulus, like she's hungry, so she starts this whole pattern of building this web. So on your notes, a FAP or a fixed action pattern, I gave you the definition already. Okay, a behavior that is always performed in the same way in response to a sign stimulus, like the truck might be a sign stimulus. Um, for example, spiders building webs or mating dances, right? Birds, they see somebody that they would like to get together with, they might do a dance. All right, next. Oh, I have another example. So here are some mating dances commonly carried out by birds, and these are examples of a fap. All right, learning. Here we go. Learning is a change in your behavior brought about by your experience, okay? And I gave you all of that example, almost all of that definition, a durable change in behavior brought about by experience. So now there's different types of learning. I'm gonna give you one example. One is habituation. Now habituation, if you go to the zoo, right? You go to the zoo and you see a lion and you go up to that lion, you're like, Rawr, rawr, lion, talk to me. The lion's probably going to ignore you, right? He's like, whatever, because he knows he can't get through the glass to get at you. But if you go out in the wild and there's a lion over there and you're like, hey, lion, rawr, rawr, you better get ready because he's running and he's going to eat you, right? The lion in the zoo is habituated. He knows he can't get you. Um, deers on the deer on the side of the road. If a car goes by, if it's not hunting season, they're really not going to be stimulated to respond in any way. So habituation is when animals do not respond in a zoo as they would in the wild, and it comes about from experience. That can happen other places too. All right, let's talk about instinct and learning. All right, so here we're going to kind of come combine a couple of things. Number one, when um, a parent uh, bird is like gone to get food and they want to regurgitate it to the baby, okay, what they'll do is they'll wag their face in front of the baby, okay? This is a sign stimulus for the baby to start pecking at that parent's beak. The pecking is a sign stimulus for the mother or the father to regurgitate the food that they ate so that the baby can eat it. If the baby is not strong enough to peck on the beak, the parent will not regurgitate. If the parent doesn't regurgitate, that means they're not wasting their food on a weak baby, okay? Because it's probably not going to survive. So over time, what they noticed, though, is that the pecking that the baby did, the accuracy improved over time. So the question is, are they getting better at what they're doing? Are they learning? Or is it possible their neck muscles are stronger and maybe they can pack more effectively on the parent? So on instinct and learning, um, it was thought that a fat, it was thought to be a fat, but the baby goals chicks, the baby goal chicks increased in their pecking accuracy as they aged and their motor skills improved. It was, it, there's a combination of learning there and it being a fat. All right, so let's talk about another thing with birds, and that has to do with imprinting, okay? Oh, wait, I got another picture for you. I'm sorry. Another one about fixed action pa patterns I forgot about. Sorry, I'm so tired today. It's been a long day, and I'm sorry I'm getting my words mixed up. I truly, truly apologize. Okay, so this is called a weaver bird, and this is kind of interesting because a weaver bird, it makes its nest, right? And, it, and the male has to make the nest in order to attract a female. So if you look towards the top, let me get my pointer, okay? If you look to the top up here, it starts by building this chamber right here at the top, and then it starts building down from the top to make this channel to get up into that chamber, okay? And this is a fixed action pattern. And you would think maybe no, but because it's so complicated and everything. But what happens is if you went along and you were mean and you kind of dethatched this part, when it's on this step right here, it doesn't know any longer how to fix this part, even though it just built it. Literally, it could have been minutes or hours before because 
it's like it checks the box. I did step one, I did step two, I did step three, I did step four. Once it's on step four, it doesn't know how to do step one anymore and it ends up just abandoning the nest. So that would be an example of a fixed action pattern. Okay, now imprinting, this is pretty interesting. So baby birds, when they're born, okay, the mother hovers over the nest, they're like pecking their way out of the eggs. They imprint on the mother, what the mother looks like, what her eyes look like, all of it, okay? And that way, when there's a whole big population of birds, they have learned their mother and they will follow their mother anywhere because they identify that as mama. Now, a man named Lorenz did an experiment where he removed the mother and when baby goslings were born, he waved his head over the baby birds and they fixated on him. They imprinted on him. And when they imprinted on him, that's it. That's mama. They would follow him everywhere. If he went swimming, they went swimming. If he walked into the barn, they'd walk into the barn. He walked into the house, they'd walk into the house. So that is imprinting. So let's do our notes there. It's a form of learning that involves a sensitive period, which is which is the only period during which a particular behavior develops. So there's like usually a certain time when all of that can go down. Um, so particular behavior develops. An example is baby chicks follow the first moving object they see after hatching. Baby chicks follow the first moving object they see after hatching. And then I just want you to know this experimenter's name and his name is Lorenz, L-O-R-E-N-Z. All right. So another one is song learning. They did some experiments with birds, in, you know, looking at imprinting. And if they were never given songs to hear, no other songs, then their voice, what they would sing, developed incompletely. You might think about this, like if somebody is deaf, right? And they can see you moving your lips and trying to mimic that when they speak. But if they haven't heard you say the word, it's harder for them to speak that in a way that you understand. Okay, so that's how it works with song learning. But then they started saying, what if we didn't have a parent bird? What if we just had tapes during their sensitive period when imprinting seems to work, right? And if they just played tapes and the baby bird got to hear it, they would learn how to sing correctly. And then the next observation they made is, what if we have an adult tutor that's with that bird all the time? If it was with that bird at the, all the time, they would learn that bird's song. All right, so those uh, underneath social interactions and learning, birds will sing the song of their tutor. Birds will sing the song of their tutor and social interactions must assist in the learning process, must assist in the learning process. All right, next, associative learning. Oh, there it is, there's a conclusion. Bear with me, bear with me. All right, okay, a little joke. All right, um, another form of imprinting, and you can add it to your notes if you want to. I didn't actually put it in the notes. I wanted to give it to you as an example, is salmon. When salmon hatch in a lake, they will then go down through the rivers and streams and they, the majority of them, some don't, they will go down, go out into the open ocean and they will be out there in the open ocean two or three years, right? And they will get bigger, stronger. They are able from the, ocean, you know, find the exact stream that they swam down when they were just baby. And they will swim all the way up, follow every twist and turn. They know whether to go left and right every time it forks, and they can go and find their home body of water. And that's where they will spawn again. I mean, that's incredible. I can walk into the grocery store 10 minutes later, walk out. I can't find my car right? They've spent three years in the open ocean and they can find their way all the way back. And what they found out is it's called olfactory imprinting. It's by smell. So they are smelling their way back to their home stream. And this is just another reason why we want to make sure we don't pollute our waters. Because when you put the pollutants in the water, it changes the smell of the water, right? And then those salmon can't find their way back in order to breed and make more salmon. Okay. Now, associative learning. When you see associative, you think associate. One thing is associated with another. So in this example right here, okay, you have an unconditioned stimulus. If you shoot somebody with this 
particular medicine, it will make them super sick. Over here, you have a naughty boy. He obviously looks naughty and angry. Now, if this naughty boy, if every time he's naughty, and I'm not saying you should do this in parenting, not at all, okay? But if you gave him a shot of this and he got super sick, then he would associate, I'm naughty, I get super sick, so maybe I shouldn't be naughty. That's an example of associative learning. And I gave you that definition in there, okay? There's two types of associative learning that we're gonna discuss. The first one I wanna show you though is this is a bird eating a monarch butterfly. So he goes to eat the monarch butterfly. It's here in his mouth, right? And then all of a sudden, it's making him so sick that he throws it up. Look, he's throwing up the monarch butter butterfly. So he's going to associate that color, right? That black and orange color of the monarch butterfly, which is also the viceroy butterfly. And he will associate that with making him sick. So he will not eat that bird anymore. All right, so there's two big types of conditioning that, that we're going to focus on. The first one is classical conditioning. If you've heard of Pavlov's dogs, maybe. Um, so in, in this experiment, what happened is, and you've seen this if you have any kind of dog, right? If you have... Um, if you keep your leash in a certain place in your house and you just walk near the closet where the leash is, your dog's like, yes, I am ready, right? Because he's associating that closet area with going for a walk with you and that's exactly what he wants to do. Well, in this case, what happened is they would bring the food, right? And normally when the dog would see the food, just normal, okay? He would start to salivate because he goes, yay, I get to eat this food, okay? So that saliva is an unconditioned response. You would just do that if you're hungry, right? And so then what they started doing is before they brought the food out, they would ring a bell, okay? They would ring a bell. And at first the dog's like, what? Okay, here comes the food, saliva, yay. But pretty soon the bell always preceded the bringing of the food. So then he became conditioned. If the bell rings, I'm getting food. So he would start to generate that saliva right away, okay? So that is classical conditioning. So it suggests, and these are your notes, it suggests that animals can be trained or conditioned to associate any response to any stimulus. Now this is a physiological response, right? He's He is just salivating. That's like a normal un unconditioned response. Just like if it was cold, you would shiver. That's an unconditioned response, right? Okay, so your example there is Pavlov's dog. So then I made a little joke here. It's supposed to be ironic. Watch what I do. I can look what I can make Pavlov do. I drool and he writes it down in the book. So that, okay, we'll leave it alone. Next, operant conditioning. Operant conditioning, okay, is when you motivate a correct behavior with either a, re a reward or a punishment, right? So for instance, um, Maybe um, when you were toilet, you probably can't remember this, but toilet training is often like that, right? If if you go to the bathroom on the toilet, yay, big boy, big girl, you get some M and M's, right? And so that it, maybe if you get straight A's in my class, you get a new Ferrari. I don't know, what, okay? So that would be rewarding. Um, if you come home late past your curfew then maybe uh, you don't get to go out anymore, right? Um, and so you learn, I better not go home, get home late because then I can't go out for a couple of weeks. So that is what a lot of, when we look at human behavior and how we train humans is either reward or punishment. Is it a carrot like or a stick? So when we look at that, you talk about Skinner and the reason why there's a rat here, will press for food, is because Skinner made what's called a Skinner box. And in this box right here, okay, this, this is terrible. This little lever right here will release food. And then these wires right here, if they do the wrong thing, that's the stick, that's the shock. He would get a shock. So he could be trained, you know, to do what, you know, to push the food, um, to push the lever for food because if he didn't, he was gonna get shocked. So operant conditioning is a stimulus response connection and it is strengthened with reward slash punishment. Reward slash punishment. So just to compare, oh, here we go. So is this classical or operant conditioning? Like roll over and I'll give you a treat. Roll over and I'll give you a treat. This would be, 
operant conditioning. And one way you can think about it is perform the operation and then I will give you this um, food. Perform this operation and then I will give you this food. All right. As my AirPods did not, um, they kind of turned off for a second. So I just want to make sure I said that this is an example of operant conditioning. All right, operant um, conditioning. All right, next. Okay, this is just a little chart to compare and contrast classical conditioning with operant conditioning. Um, a couple things I want you to see. In classical, that's Pavlov's then the signal comes before the behavior, and that behavior is a reflex, it's physiological. It's called respondent conditioning. And this works with involuntary behavior like saliva, right? And this behavior is thought to be elicited. Whereas operant conditioning, right, it's a reinforcing or, pun or reinforcing or punishing stimulus is given after the behavior. So in this one, it works with voluntary behavior, things that you choose. And this behavior is said to be emitted. All right. So that's just a quick summary of it. Okay. And then cognitive learning. Cognitive learning. Okay. Oh. Yes, good. So cognitive learning, there's a couple different ones we'll talk about here. One is observation and imitation. So in this case, I don't know if you can see the baby. The baby's right here. See the baby's head? And then here's the baby's little arm hanging on. So he's watching mom. Um, these are Japanese macaws, I believe. These are the same ones if you were with me for the earlier presentations. These are the ones that go in the hot tub in order to warm up, right? So he will, the baby will watch mom wash the sweet potatoes, right? And then he will wash sweet potatoes in the same way. Um, if you uh, watched your parents make spaghetti, you'll probably make it the same way. So that's observation and, and imitation imitation and the words you need for your notes there you just just to finish it up is watching others okay another one is called insight so insight learning is problem solving now i know i know i know i know there are no like monkeys that are picking up guns and shooting them but if they did that would be an example of insight but the reason why i bring this up is in older books they would show again and again these monkeys given boxes and bananas or whatever treats are hanging from the ceiling. And in this experiment, the monkeys stack the boxes up in order to access the bananas. The issue is this has been in books for years. It has never, ever, ever been repeated. So it's not a good example. So I always show this monkey here to remind you that experiments, they need to be able to be repeated, right? So you can validate those results. So these are examples of insight. In this example, this crow, there was a string hanging down. It's got a piece of meat right here that the crow wants to eat. But obviously, if the crow flies at it, the meat moves and he can't grab it. So what did this crow do? And this has been repeated. He stand, he's up on the twig. He reaches down with his beak, pulls the string up, steps on the string, holds it there. Then he can reach for a little bit more and step it up and so, slowly bring the meat up so that he could eat it. This never happened, okay? But that is insight. When an animal solves a problem without having any prior experience with the situation. And then ravens have learned to retrieve food. Sea otters save rocks to bash open clams. So that is another example there. All right, next. All right, so we're gonna go into behavioral ecology next, and I'm gonna pause this video here, and we'll make the next video part two.